On this episode of Law Weekly, we look at the plight of magistrates in Cross River State. Their recent protests once again brings to the fore the issue of the independence and funding of the judiciary. And this and more form the core of my conversation on the program today. We also have a recap of some of the major events that shaped the judiciary in 2020 and some of the expectations for the new year. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shealy. The issue of the magistrates started with a peaceful protest following the alleged non-payment of their salaries for 24 months. As we speak, we are all city magistrates manning different courts in the states, dispensing justice for the peace and tranquility of our state, cross river states. Now, we kept on waiting for the state government to pay us our salary. And I know some persons will be asking, why are they dragged on to this point? Why are we protesting now? We decided not to protest all this while, in order to give peace a chance by dialoguing with the government. Dialogue has failed. 24 hours after the protest, the Cross River State's Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice met with the aggrieved magistrates. He says the purpose is to open up dialogue between the parties, especially as the appointment was done without notice to the state government. Their lawyers, they understand that they must act properly at all times. There's no amount of provocation that will make you, especially that you are lawyers, when you know the process that brought you on board is, in a, is not proper. You can only be appealing not to threaten anybody. So my appeal to the magistrates is that they conduct themselves properly and appeal for graces so that, you know, uh, this problem can be resolved peacefully. We followed the due process, followed the public notice. We were... Uh, um, these job vacancies we have advertised in the cross -water judiciary, applied, were screened, employed, given appointment letters, trained and posted to courts. And we have been discharging our duties. With the magistrates insisting that due process was followed, it's important for all parties to work towards an amicable and fair resolution. And that's the view of my guest on the show today, Mr. Olusegun Fabumi S.A.N., popularly known in the legal community as Olufab. He studied law at the University of Lagos and was called to the bar in 1989. He has diverse legal practice background, having worked at reputable chambers at various times, acquiring vast experience in all areas of legal practice. Last year, December, he was conferred with a prestigious rank, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. I began the interview with his reaction to the protest of the magistrates. Well, the, the problem of magistracy, uh, I can say it starts from the constitutional provision, uh, the definition of a judicial officer. You know, it's contained in the 1999 Constitution, Section 318, and uh, did not include magistrates. It's only stopped at the Court of, Court of Appeal and Sharia Court of Appeal. So the magistracy is basically under the control of the state. The appointment, promotion, discipline, um, retirement, and anything relating to them is by the state government. And that is where the problem starts from. And um, I think the problem is most often political because you find out that it is who hires that fires. Unlike the uh, High Court judges, their appointment is by the National Judicial Council. Their payment of salaries is by the National Judicial Council. And you will see that their discipline and everything related to them is by the National Judicial Council. The only thing that the state is involved is uh, allowances. So you find out that all High Court judges in Nigeria, their salaries are the same. In the Court of Appeal, Sharia, uh, of Court of Appeal, uh, customer Court of Appeal, you see that all of them they have uniform structure in salary payment. So, but the magistracy, they are hired and appointed by the governor under the State Judicial Service Commission. So before you get approval, unlike the High Court judges, you go to the NJC. Mm. But when you appoint a magistrate, you get approval from the governor. And I've been able to find out what happened in Cross River. Okay. What happened, as I was told you know, with information, is that the governor asked that 
19 magistrates be appointed. And the acting chief judge then, two years ago, appointed about 43 or 45. In contravention in of, contravention what the, of said. the directive of the governor. So, and the governor said, look, I'm not going to pay salaries for the, so the, 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 the magistracy is under the state civil service. In fact, you see that even when they retire, their, their retirement is also under the state pension scheme. But the obvious question would be if the governor, if the acting chief judge at that time acted in contravention of the governor's directive, why didn't the governor stop them from working when he knew he was not going to pay? But you see, that's where the problem is because the governor and the judiciary, you know the way people behave, that's my own conclusion. You know, as, as the acting chief judge, he believes that this is my court, this is my, this is my jurisdiction. And I can do anything I want to do. When he doesn't have when the, power he doesn't have the powers. And because of the payments, it's going to come from the state. So if he is going to make the payments of salaries to those magistrates, there wouldn't be any problem. So, but he's exercising an authority that is not total. Because you are going to hire. You, before you hire, you even get approval from the governor. And now, if you now get approval and you can't pay, that's where the problem comes in. So, he should have hired the number of magistrates approved by the governor since the payment of salaries and all other benefits is going to come from the state government. But then this all brings up the issue of the funding and the financial independence of the judiciary, which the judiciary has been complaining about. Yeah, that's, that's the problem. Well, actually, I've thought about it and we've had a discourse on it about bringing in the magistracy as judicial officers. It looks so difficult because of the number of people involved. Let me give you an because example. Because of the number of the magistrates? Yes, the number of the magistrates. Let me give you an example. In Lagos alone, we have almost close to 200 magistrates. If NJC, because if you are talking of independence as contained in the constitution. Firstly, the constitution has to be amended to accommodate the magistrates. And I don't think the federal government is ready. Mm. So, but if maybe the constitution is amended and payments of the funds for the salaries of the magistrates are paid to the State uh, Judicial Service Commission, I think that can solve a lot of problems so that the payment is not coming directly from the state government. So going forward, with a view to finding solutions, yes. is there any, I know that you, you've said that the governor did not give approval. Okay. So is there any justification for the stance that he has taken, that because he didn't give approval, he would not pay? And what should be the role of the state judicial service with a view to resolving the situation in Cross River State? I, I think it's straightforward. Since the appointment itself, you sought approval from the governor. I don't see any reason why you should appoint more than the number that has been approved. Because the payment of their salaries and emoluments is going to, be, to come from the state government. Wow. And the state government actually knows the number of people it can cater for at a particular point in time. So they will not be paid? They will not be paid. But what I, what I think the... In fact, the acting chief judge that appointed them is no longer there. So that is another problem. Because we haven't thought, heard that there, were, there, there are politics behind even uh, the appointments no, it's, it's, it's of, of the, the CJ. No, it's, the poli it's political. CJ. It's political. I mean, it's political. You know, this, the Cross River State judiciary has been in problems for some time now as regards the appointment of the substantive chief judge. Yes. So, uh, the governor has been appointing acting, acting chief judges judge. for almost three times now. So, and that as uh, itself has created a lot of problems in the state judiciary. So, anybody going in as an acting chief judge, maybe you want to do what he wants to do within the period of time he has been given the opportunity. And so, it's political. And that's, where, that's another problem. And that's why the NJC is always trying to nip it in the board with the governors that, yes, it is your state, but we have the final approval as regards, because we are paying, we are in control, 
we are to discipline. We are not the one to discipline them. Or else, like it's happening now, look at the magistrate. Assuming it is their court, their court justice will not be paid. But the JNJC the, the has been trying to make sure that the governors don't just kick the judges around like boss. But what solution do you see? Because it's sounding like they won't <laughs> get paid. Well, I think for those who were approved, I thought that initially that acting chief judge, if the governor says, look, I'm not going to pay, he should have written to those people and withdraw the appointments immediately. Hmm. And that will have solved a lot of problems. But the person who is there now was not the one who appointed them. Exactly. There. So, but I think the governor himself, and I, I keep on asking, I mean, if you were appointed two years ago, that's another issue for this cause. And you've stayed there for two years without being paid salaries and emolument. So how you survive it? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, there are so many issues involved. So many in, unanswered yes, questions. Yes, unanswered questions. But I, I think the governor as the governor of the state, should find a solution to the matter. He is the one that can find a solution to it. And with the issues that have you know, generated you know, in the country, I believe strongly that we should find a way to resolve it so that the name of the judiciary in Cross River State you know, can be cleaned up. Still on this issue of money, let's talk about corruption in the judiciary. Yes. We all saw, towards the end of last year, the ICPC report, mm. which ranks the judiciary tops as the most corrupt uh, sector in the country. And I, I am wondering how the perception that the judiciary is corrupt, is, it's very important. Is it a systemic problem or an institutional problem? What do you think? I disagree with ICPC strongly. In fact, that report is not even backed up by any data. You know, so many people have asked on what basis did you come up with that report? They said they interviewed judges, they interviewed lawyers, they interviewed who court would, clerks. Who and who did they interview? If you want to be clear on these issues, you need to bring out the data. You interview how many people? We have a whole country in Nigeria of 36 states. And then we now came up with a report. And believe you me, Nigeria, the problem of Nigeria of corruption is holistic. What I meant by that is that you cannot point accusing fingers on the judiciary alone. And look at it. If you look at the police, the customs, so many organizations that deal with people every day, what have they done as regards corruption? So you cannot talk of judiciary, and it takes two to tango. And the corruption you are talking about, and you know, I agree that why there's so much focus on the judiciary is because it's the last hope of the common man. But the problem is when you do three good things and you do one that is bad, that one that is bad is that people will report about it. It will stick out. Yeah. It will stick out. Uh, that is normal with human beings. But I can tell you that in Nigeria of today, if you talk about the, the percentage of people, the judges, the magistrates, let me even leave the magistrates, judges, starting from the Supreme Court down the line, we can give a score mark that yes, in terms of corruption, we are doing very well. In terms of uh, not being corrupt, we are doing very well. In this new year, 2021, what reforms would you like to see in the judiciary, especially with um, justice delivery in the country? Well, I think it still boils down to the issue of uh, virtual hearing. That has been the major issue since last year when COVID started. The COVID-19 has made us to look at alternatives in uh, justice delivery. And um, in my chambers here, I've had virtual hearing not less than four, five, six times. And believe you me, it's so convenient. Because I sit in the comfort of my conference room, set up the gadgets, and then I talk to the judge. But the truth of the matter is the societal climb in terms of our facilities. So if you can improve on our facilities, I think we have a very good opportunity to improve on justice delivery in Nigeria. It will just be the job of the lawyer through maybe his clerks, 
or litigation officers to go and file the processes in court. And then if we talk of also e-filing, that is also very important. <clears throat> in Lagos State, you see what happened during the NSAS protest. The Bush uh, complex, uh, judicial complex, was completely burnt. Mm -hmm. As I'm talking to you, I have not less than 12 files that were completely burnt. But if those things were in e-format, uh, e e e e there wouldn't have been any problem. It can refer to it easily. So I think the judiciary should work more on that in these uh, coming years. Welcome back. Like many other sectors of the economy, the judiciary was totally unprepared for the rampaging COVID-19 pandemic. But how did they respond to it and other challenges in the year 2020? We have a review of the sector up next. With the spread of the coronavirus across the country, the federal government initially issued directives and regulations for a partial shutdown of economic and social activities. Taking a cue from the government, the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Tanko Mohammed, also ordered a partial shutdown of the courts from March 24, 2020, which effectively suspended sittings, except for matters which were considered urgent, essential, or time-bound, according to the extant laws. The implication of this was that some stakeholders started to clamor for a recourse to technology in line with global trends and especially to deal with the growing caseload. The Borno State Judiciary took the lead and was the first to conduct virtual hearings. Lagos quickly followed suit with Ogun and the FCT courts also joining in early. My personal disappointment is that we did not rev this up. We just tend to relax once the cause of um, immediate cause of some pressure is released from us. The moment um, the pandemic didn't appear to have done the sort of damage uh, many of us thought it would do, and there was relax relaxation of the lockdown and activities returned, again, the judges um, more or less insisted on um, um, uh, in-court hearings. Apart from the impact of the medical emergency on the judiciary and the seeming reluctance to adapt and stick with technology, a lot of lawyers are still struggling to wrap their heads around two interesting and somewhat controversial judgments of the Supreme Court on the 2019 governorship elections in Imo and Bielsa states. On February 13, 2020, a day before their swearing-in, the court nullified the return of the Bielsa state governor-elect, Mr. David Lyon, and his running mate. A month earlier, on January 14, 2020, the same court nullified the return of Governor Emeka Ehedioha of Imo State and ordered the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to issue a fresh certificate of return to Senator Hoku Zodima, who the commission had initially declared fourth in the polls. The basis upon which the Imo State Governor was declared the winner of the Imo State gubernatorial election is still a, still a, still a legal uh, conundrum for many people to understand how the Supreme Court arrived at that decision. Two other decisions from the courts also generated a lot of interest in the year 2020. One was a decision also of the Supreme Court delivered on May 8, which overturned the judgment of a federal high court, convicting Senate Chief Whip and former governor of Abia State, Oji Uzo Kalu. On December 16, the Court of Appeal Abuja Division nullified the seven-year jail sentence handed to a former spokesperson of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, Ulisa Metsu. Another issue which drew the criticism of lawyers was the failure of President Muhammadu Buhari to act on the list of appointment of four serving justices of the Court of Appeal sent to him by the National Judicial Council. They were to be appointed as justices of the Supreme Court. It took the President 11 months to act on the recommendations, and at the time there were only 12 justices of the Supreme Court instead of 21 as provided for in the Constitution. In June of the same year, the Court of Appeal also got a substantive president of the court with a swearing-in of Justice Monika Dongba Mensem. 
issues of financial autonomy and adequate funding of the judiciary was also a major talking point throughout the year 2020. To underscore the importance of the issues, President Muhammadu Buhari on May 22, 2020, signed the Presidential Executive Order No. 10 to create a framework for the implementation of financial autonomy for state legislatures and state judiciaries. This has, however, not put the issue to rest, as the 36 states of the Federation have gone before the Supreme Court to challenge the order. We, we really need to do something about the funding of the judiciary and who controls that those funding. Now, this is a really big issue. I don't know why um, up till now with all the voices we have speaking about this thing, nothing is still being done. For the bar, 2020 ushered in a new president of the Nigerian Bar Association. But the victory of a member of the outer bar was not without some controversies. First, there appeared to be a divide between the younger members of the bar and members of the inner bar. There was also concerns about the voter register and the electronic platform on which the elections were held. After two postponements, the elections eventually held from midnight of Wednesday, the 29th of July, 2020. The former chairman of the MBA section of business law, Ulumide Akwata, took an early lead in the polls, one he held on to till the polls closed 24 hours later. He defeated Dr. Babatude Ajibade SAN and Daily Additional SAN. His opponents in the election had complaints about the conduct of the election, with allegations of fraud, rigging and manipulations also made by some other lawyers. This has been a recurring decimal in the NBA elections since the introduction of electronic voting in the 2015 Constitution of the Association. To his credit, Mr. Akwata did not deny the imperfections in the election after his swearing-in. He immediately set up a committee to review the process and suggest reforms. Uh, I ran my campaign under the uh, a slogan, making the bar work for all. And I meant every word of it. I intend to make the bar work for all of its members. And I intend to make the bar work for society. Two other crises also rocked the association in the year 2020. The first was the creation of the new NBA by some group of lawyers who felt that the disinvitation of the Kaduna State Governor Nasir El Rafai to the association's annual national conference was politically and ethnically motivated. The crisis appears to have been resolved for now with the widespread consultations of the NBA president and the intervention of some bar elders. The second crisis, which is yet to be resolved, is the purported amendment of the 2007 Rules of Professional Conduct for Lawyers by the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abubakar Malami, SAN. The amendment generated serious controversy and debate among lawyers as to who has the authority to amend the rules and whether due process was followed. The year 2020 ended with a Nigerian Corruption Index report of a pilot survey of the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission, ICPC, released on December 1st, which ranked the judiciary as the most corrupt sector in the country, with about 9.4 billion naira in total said to have been offered as bribes, especially in election matters. Most of the people, members of the political elite believe that judgment can be bought that justice can be compromised. Well, that frame of mind must stop. It remains to be seen if the perception of the judiciary as the most corrupt institution will change in the year 2021. Not much has been seen with the change of guard at the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. Will the change of guard in the leadership of the Nigerian bar in the year 2020, many lawyers look forward to a united and disciplined bar in the new year. The bar appears to be starting well with its monitoring of activities at the judicial panels set up to review cases of police brutality across the country. The expectation is that the bar and the bench will always champion the interests of the majority for the greater good of the nation. And that's our program this week. Don't forget that you can find these and past episodes of the program on our YouTube page. I'm Shala Shealy. Thank you very much for watching and see you next week.